Someone you love is ill. They fall down, unable to move, in constant pain, going into tremors for hours, sometimes days at a time. It's like a nightmare, but you don't wake up. This is what happened to our son Ryan two years ago. We took him to many doctors around the country. We talked to a total of 50 doctors, either in person or by phone. Um, there really wasn't any explanation for his collection of symptoms. The pain had started in his ankle, and we got him an MRI of his ankle as soon as we could. The MRI showed nothing wrong, but the process of getting the MRI was horrible. Because of his chronic pain syndrome, it hurt him terribly. I could hear him screaming through two heavy locked doors while this image that you see here was obtained. It turned out that the pain moved around his body. Later on, it moved up to his head. Again, we got another MRI. This was a little less painful for him, but it still showed nothing wrong. He looked fine. I'd been doing brain research for almost 30 years when he got sick, and I had no idea what was going on. I felt so confused, really frustrated. His symptoms got so bad that he had to check into a hospital. While he was in the hospital, the doctors did their tests, scratched their heads, and decided it must all be in his head. They said that we shouldn't coddle him, that we shouldn't continue looking for a solution because it would just make him worse. Of any advice that his mother and I have ever gotten in our lives, we're the most happy that we didn't take this advice. <laughs> Two years later now, Ryan's doing much better. We still have some bad days now and again, but we know how to deal with them. It turned out that his chronic pain syndrome um, created a situation where the drugs given to him for his chronic pain created those motor symptoms, making him fall down, giving him tremors, and so on. In addition to that, he had a second, apparently unrelated illness that went undiagnosed for years, mostly because of poor laboratory practice with the lab we were using. We went to an outside lab, got the correct diagnosis, got him treated, and within a few weeks, he was pain-free. I started to think, why did it take so long to get him treated? Why did so many intelligent, caring doctors who really wanted the best for Ryan come to such a wrong diagnosis? And why didn't they think, even think, much earlier that the drugs given to him for his pain might be causing more problems than they were solving? So I've come to some conclusions about this that I want to share with you today. I think that most of us, doctors and patients alike, have come to believe that big medicine is the best medicine. That is, that complex medical procedures, pills, and so on, will provide us with a cure, and that we don't have any alternatives. How big is big medicine? Did you know that we spend between $2.5 and $3 trillion a year on healthcare in this country? It's a huge amount. It's so large that there isn't even a good estimate. Did you know that for every drug that comes to market, pharmaceutical companies spend an average of $5 billion? Who pays for all that? We do. There's more problems, too. Did you know that New Mexico leads the country in the rate of death from drug use? A lot of these are prescription medications that are simply being misused. Within a month after surgery, 200,000 people die nationwide, and 2 million people pick up a new infection from a stay in a hospital. Now, many more people would die without medication, without going to the hospital, without surgery. But if there were a safer, better alternative, wouldn't that be preferable? So what I'll show you are three examples. Technologies that are safer, cheaper, and in some cases more effective than the current standard of care. And almost nobody's heard of them. So what I'll show you first is a movie of a young man with Tourette syndrome. His symptoms were so bad that he was giving himself whiplash. The next movie I'll show you is the same young man after receiving one of the treatments that I want to describe to you today. Amazing. I mean, you, I've always wanted, look at, looked at people and just wishing that I could just stay still. Can you tell that he was ever even sick? So if I told you that his treatment involved a pill or a complex medical procedure, you probably wouldn't have any trouble believing me. But it wasn't anything like that. It was one of these. It doesn't have any medication, no moving parts. You wear it like a mouth guard. 
it applies pressure to your back teeth, that interacts with your nervous system in a way that suppresses motor illness, the symptoms of motor illness. So with one of these, he was able to be helped. I'll show you another example. This is a young woman with a, a very different syndrome than Tourette's, but she's also in incapacitated. This is Dr. Brendan Stack who invented this technique. And along with Dr. Anthony Sims in the Washington, D.C. area, they've treated hundreds of patients this way. This was brought to me by Dr. Mark Cooper. Mark is also a neuroscientist whose daughter happens to have a syndrome very similar to my son Ryan's. We've been working together trying to understand how this works. We're using a small donation from a patient whose life was essentially saved by, by one of these mouth guards. And so far we're seeing that it seems to affect activity in the cerebellum. Now what Mark is doing is developing a, a cheap disposable version of these mouth guards that could be given to a patient. The patient would put it in their mouth and see if it helps. If it does, they could find a dentist to get a, to get a more permanent version of this. There's nothing else that could get a, a patient out of a, a wheelchair that quickly, really. Now, there's another example of simple, cheap, safe technologies. The next one, remember that I told you that Ryan had a pain syndrome and his reaction to the drug given to him for that caused all sorts of problems. What if I told you there's a new technology that doesn't use any medication to treat pain? It's called transcranial direct current stimulation. This is Brian Kaufman, one of my graduate students, and he's wearing a TDCS unit. It's basically two small electrodes that are put on the head, and a very low electric current is passed through them. This isn't like electroshock therapy. Most people that have it turned on can't even feel it. It's a very, very low current, but it has huge effects. So we were developing this technique even before Ryan got sick to try and see if we could increase learning in people. This shows a graph of the amount of learning, and the blue bar shows the amount of learning in people without TDCS, and the red bar shows the amount of learning with TDCS. And you see that with TDCS, people are learning almost twice as much. It's really a tremendous effect, and we've replicated a number of times. I didn't believe it the first time. I thought it was an anomaly. We did it again and again and again, and it keeps happening. It's real. We're finding that it also increases certain forms of attention, and it increases chemicals in your brain that you use to, or that you need to encode memories. And between the two of those, that's probably what enhances memory. In addition to that, we're collaborating with groups that are using it to treat chronic pain. And using a version of TDCS, they're having great results in their early trials, but they're not done yet. We're also using it to treat addiction and Parkinson's disease, and we're talking about how to treat schizophrenia using this. It's all very exciting. If you can increase learning, maybe you can get a college degree in less time. Um, people with learning disorders or Alzheimer's disease, potentially, you could treat those, but without any chemical medication. And I think what this will turn into is a form of medication that doesn't use chemicals, it uses electricity. But in every other way, we should start thinking of it as a new form of medication, but without a lot of side effects either. In fact, we can find very few. I want to tell you about a third um, treatment, or a third uh, technology, that would have helped Ryan as well. Remember I told you when he got his MRI, it hurt him terribly because it vibrated so much. There's a group at Los Alamos National Laboratory headed up by Michelle Espy. This is Michelle and part of her crew. They're developing an ultra-low magnetic field MRI system. It's like a regular MRI, but it operates at a magnetic field very close to that of the Earth's and you get MRI images that are very similar to what you see in a large MRI. It doesn't work as well as a big MRI yet, but with a little bit of work, it will improve. They've had trouble getting funding for this. When they find it, I think they'll be able to develop this as a reasonable option. There's a lot of advantages. It's small, it's cheap, it would be cheaper than a big MRI, and more portable. You could put it on a pickup truck. Especially in the third world, this could make a huge difference. There's only three MRI systems in sub-Saharan Africa for millions of people. It could make a difference there. Around the world, even here, a neighborhood doctor could get their own MRI that can't afford it now. So I've shown you three technologies, each of them safer, cheaper, and potentially more effective than the current standard of care. I'm not saying that 
simpler technology is always better, but it could be. In fact, I'm a big fan of big technology. I've spent almost 30 years studying the brain using every technology I could get my hands on. I love technology. That's not the problem. The problem is that we've become obsessed with big technology. We think we've gone to the moon, we've gotten ourselves out of caves into houses. A lot of great has, things have come from technology. But we've come to think that it always has to get bigger and it always has to be expensive. And that's just not true. So there's three barriers, really, to um, the development of these technologies. One is our, our obsession with big technology, I think. The second is that um, the government requires that any new technology that's used to treat a certain disorder be tested very extensively for its efficacy and for safety. This testing is hugely expensive. If you go and get a pill, those pills are expensive. Part of that cost is the cost of testing. If you sell an expensive product, you can cover that cost. If you're trying to develop a cheap product, there's no budget to cover the huge cost of testing. It can be millions of dollars. So that's one barrier. Another barrier is knowledge. It, you'll notice that pharmaceutical companies advertise a lot, and they spend a lot of money on advertising. It's very expensive. But again, they sell an expensive product. They have the money to pay for advertising. For technologies like these, there's no money. So a neighborhood doctor both doesn't know that these technologies exist and shouldn't really refer them for their patient unless they're sure their work. So you need both good methods of testing, good objective methods of testing, and a way to get the word out. Now, my way to get the word out is to give a TED Talk. And being a concerned parent and somebody who's seen what can go wrong, I understand the value of this, and that's why I'm here today. But what else can we do? How can we develop these technologies? And aside from these, there's many more. I've just shown you three that I know about personally because I've worked with them. I've seen them work. There's at least a dozen more that I've heard of. So what can we do? There's a couple things. When you go to your doctor, always ask them about side effects of the drugs or whatever treatment you're getting. Make sure that it's safe. And if you leave your doctor's office, you start to take the medication, you feel a little funny later, don't assume you're just getting old. Don't make any assumption about it. It may be the medication. Go back to your doctor and say, hey, I've had these funny side effects. Could you please um, think about whether or not I should still be on this drug? That's one thing. Another is, if you know of anybody who um, has either a motor illness or a pain syndrome, have them talk to their doctor about these technologies. And if their doctor doesn't know about it, have them check our website at smallermedicine.org. We're using this as a way to get information out about these different technologies. Finally, I think we all need to consider whether or not, as a culture, as a group, we've become a little over-focused on big technologies. And we should start thinking whether smaller, simpler, safer technologies might be possible for us. I think if we all work together, we can start a small revolution in medicine. Thank you.